Hey folks, it looks like we have some people turning up. Hurrah! How do? Hi. Hey then. Greetings, friends. Okay, we'll be starting in a few minutes. Uh, but just give it a couple of minutes for people to come in. Oh, we need to admit some more people in now. I'll be honest, wasn't expecting anyone to turn up, or maybe two or three people tops. Uh, but if we kind of fill a screen of maybe 10 people, I'll be a very happy boy. And I think we're up to eight, 11 people. Fantastic. All right, then. Uh, okay. I'm just going to give it two more minutes to see if anyone else is coming in. And then if you're sitting all comfortably, I guess we can begin. All right. So, Conan, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? I'm very, very well. Okay, I think these are all the people we have here now. And uh, what I'll try doing briefly is, uh, first of all, say hello to Denton, because he's been very generous to actually uh, a, do a load of cool work on Drawdown, but also put something into a kind of coherent presentation for us so that we can actually have some kind of, well, he can take us through a kind of tour of the stuff he's been doing for the last like year and a half, two years or so. And we've still got people coming in. Oh my God, I, re I didn't realize you need to individually admit people when you do kind of webinar style things like this, which is going to be a bit of a pain, but I think it should be more, should, should more or less be okay. So I'm going to share a thing with you folks, if I may, in this ch chat channel here. This is the deck that I'm going to be working from for the next about hour, hour, an hour or so. And um, the thing I'd like to draw your attention to uh, is, the, is basically how to do this Zoom call well, I suppose. All right. And all right, okay, even more people coming. Sweet. Hi, Melissa, and, and they keep coming. All right, at five o'clock, in five minutes, I'm going to stop because there is just a steady su supply of people and I keep getting messages saying, someone else wants to come in, someone else wants to come in. So, all right, let's see if I can share this with you folks. See, see if you can see what I see. All right. It's at this point here that I realize I have too many windows open, basically. Like a... All right, can you folks see a screen of mine at the moment, which should be showing yep. how, to, uh, how to get the best results out of this Zoom, right? Awesome, okay. This is what I'd like you folks to do if you can, when, you're not, when someone isn't show, sharing their screen, largely because we are in a moment of, well, let's be honest, relative isolation. And seeing a lot of kind of smiling, waving friends or friendly faces is actually quite a nice way to get past this. Also, there is no real concept of eye contact in Zoom. So if we do kind of go to the part where there is a conversation and you would like to respond to someone, please use the name and say, and, 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 and use someone's name, because otherwise you can't tell who I'm looking at. So for example, which of the 15 people am I looking at right now? You can't tell. So this is some, some kind, of, kind of Zoom 101 things we need to bear in mind. Uh, I think, um, just bear me two seconds. I, need, I think I need to add a, allow a few more people in as well. We've had a few more people coming coming in and oh wow we've, we've got some uh, so, okay this is now 20 people oh and we've actually got okay we, we have fight we, we have solved this so it's not just blokes blokes in the room now as well so uh, we are i think we're actually probably pretty close to the typical kind of gender balance in tech companies really so uh, but it's it's better than nothing i suppose all right i'm going to start if that's okay with you folks so um welcome to Oh God, more people coming. All right. Hey, Chris, do you, I can handle that if you want to make Actually, can you? Yeah, is, if that's possible, Melissa, that'd be fantastic. I'm not sure. Yeah, if I, I'll figure it out. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for that, Melissa. All right, so welcome to um, Developing Drawdown, which is uh, one of the first kind of like um, show and tell or cat video things that we're going to be doing to allow people to kind of like showcase some of the work they're doing and talk about why they do some of the work that they do because, well, it's nicer for us to kind of know each other really, I suppose. 
this here, if you can see my screen, I think, uh, is uh, what is basically the rough plan. There's a brief introduction, which we are more or less sticking to. Uh, there is then a, uh, we've got Denton talking for about 20 minutes. If he needs a bit more time, uh, I'm in favor of him providing, him being able to talk more because there's a lot. It's gonna be quite difficult to, to squeeze drawdown and two years of turning it into cool, cool code in 20 minutes. And then we'll have a bit of a kind of lightly moderated Q&A where we can have some discussions around this kind of stuff, all right? So again, these are why my suggestion for using Zoom in the most kind of like pro-social fashion. And uh, remember though, if you're struggling to talk, please do raise your hand and uh, I'll do what I can to uh, bring some attention to you when you're speaking. Of course, it helps if your camera is on, if that's gonna happen. And uh, first of all, I should probably say, um, if you do not know who I am and you've just joined, hello, my name is Chris Adams. I'm one of the organizers of Climate Action Tech. Another one of the organizers here is Melissa, um, who I think is on video. And if she raise, raises her hand, you might be able to see her as By well. By the way, uh, I can't invite people in unless you make me a host. Oh God, let's just do that. How do I, okay, cripes. Sorry, folks. Let's see if I can um, make, is that possible? Let's see. Melissa, Tung. ah, make a co-host, here we are. Okay, now that she is a co-host, I think Melissa is also able to add people in. Okay, cool. So you have that. And now uh, someone else has taken the lead of tracking all the people's faces as they come in now, great. Um, if you do not know what Climate Action Tech is, uh, which would be weird because most of you are, are either faces or you've seen it through this. Uh, Climate Action Tech is basically an online community of tech professionals when we use our skills, tools, and influence to amplify the climate movement. So that might be starting companies, it might be pushing for change, or it might be uh, working out where you can be effective in terms of policy, or even just where you work locally, really. This is part of a series of online events that we're doing all through April, uh, which we're kind of referring to as Earth Month. And uh, you can follow the link in this deck that I've just shared with you to see all the other events. We have some other talks by other members about uh, some interesting topics which may catch your eyes. And uh, there is also a really interesting, basically, course from some people that are called Terra, at Terra Do, some other kind of CAT members who are, who basically got some other, you know, mind, the, the best minds of the universe to, in, in the unit of, of an, basically climate experts talking about, uh, to, to, talking about this and providing a structured course so you can actually level up and understand the things you need to do to actually be effective as a professional trying to affect some kind of change. Today, uh, we are here for developing drawdown. Um, Denton uh, is, um, Denton's been a member of Climate Action Tech for about a year, maybe a year and a half or so. And uh, I got to know Denton largely through him joining some of the clean coffee uh, events that we did before. And I found out he started working on drawdown. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Denton if that's, if that's okay with you. And uh, Denton, um, I'm just going to, I think I should, I'm able to make you a co-presenter. Let's see if I can do this now. I'm going to set you as a co-host now. Uh, yes. Okay. And then I think now uh, it's possible for me to hand over to you. Denton's going to be doing a talk about the work he's been doing uh, with at Drawdown. And I don't want to waste too much of the time already. So as soon as I figure out how to pass over the screen to him, I think I'm going to. Here we are. Give mouse control to Denton Yenfri. Oh, hang on, no, that's him, that'd be him controlling my computer. That's not what I want at all. <laughs> okay, two folks, uh, stop sharing that. Okay, here we are. I think the thing I need to do now is basically spotlight uh, Denton. And then I think Denton, I think you're able to start sharing your screen. So uh, yeah. Denton, take it away. It's all yours now, right? Um, I think so. Can you hear me? Yep. And do you see the slides? Is that a no? Yes. Yeah, we all okay. see it. Okay. Okay. Let me. I did rehearse this, but uh, the actual uh, event tends to uh, uh, go off rehearsal. So, um, yes. Welcome, everyone. My my name is Denton Gentry. Uh, we are here for the uh, the original purpose of the internet, which is watching cat videos. <laughs> uh, this particular one is about uh, software development for Project Drawdown. Um, Project Drawdown was uh, founded in 2014 
uh, to create a comprehensive plan to reverse global warming. Uh, and that took the form of, of researching proven techniques and solutions to both reduce new emissions of greenhouse gases and to draw down and sequester prior emissions uh, until we, as human society, reach the point of drawdown. Uh, the project is organized as a uh, core permanent a staff of permanent employees, eight altogether, uh, the executive director, Jonathan Foley, VPs for research and operations and other areas. The ongoing work of developing the models for these solutions is mostly done by annual cohorts of researchers. They typically work six month uh, terms, uh, each roughly once a year. They're mostly grad students and postdocs. They, 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 it heavily comes from academia. And they're domain experts in the areas of the drawdown solutions. So energy, agriculture, uh, all of these uh, specialist fields. There have been a total of about 80, 80 uh, researchers in these cohorts over the years. There's also a set of senior researchers in each sector, like uh, one for energy, uh, one for waste, uh, who sign on for longer terms than, than six months at a time. Uh, I'm one of those uh, with a, a focus area of technology. Uh, really, that in practice means code monkey. Um, to be clear, though, Drawdown has been a volunteer effort for me. Uh, I wanted to use the skills from the tech industry to try and make an impact on climate. Uh, so let's talk about the models. Um, the, the details we're discussing today have already been made public before at a, a research to action conference uh, in September of last year. They're perhaps not widely known. This is a, a fairly obscure level of detail, but nothing here is secret or confidential or, or otherwise uh, problematic. So at the start of the project back in 2014, the tool that was chosen to create the climate so uh, solution models was Microsoft Excel. Now this, this was a reasonable choice at the time uh, when you're starting from nothing and, and you're going to build models. Excel is very flexible. It would be able to do whatever direction the, the models went and whatever the needs of the project were. It's also quite approachable. There have been 80 researchers who uh, have joined the project over the years and they're, they've all been able to come up to speed on how the model works. The solution models are all fairly similar, uh, mostly in kind of two clusters that are, are uh, similar within themselves. Uh, reduction and replacement solutions are for things like energy or transportation, where there are physical uh, infrastructure mainly, and land solutions, which are agriculture and food production. There's also a, a few more kind of unique outliers where the, the model for the solution differs more than the rest do. Uh, things like food waste and plant-rich diet are examples of those. Um, so if Excel was the right tool for the job and it, it, it really has worked quite well, why change? Well, with the number of solutions that have now been modeled by the project, there are about 100 Excel files that are being actively maintained. And many of these contain copies of the underlying model. It's to the point where people working on the models will actively avoid doing anything that would require them to go open the other 99. Um, that's a problem. You, you want to allow a system to evolve and not discourage people from, from doing that evolution. Um, additionally, uh, over the years, with Excel, the workflow is basically one person at a time one person works on a given solution at any given time. Because if two people do, there's just not a good way to merge the changes that each of them made to their individual files. It's a manual process involving copy and paste and errors inevitably uh, creep in. There are solutions to that with things like SharePoint, but, but over the years that was too high of a bar. And so the, the project has worked by um, having people make local copies of the Excel files and then submit them. And finally, though the initial goal of the project was to uh, publication of a book, um, the effort going forward is mostly online. Uh, Excel is not your friend when it comes to distributing things online. The, the process is basically copy everything out of Excel and set it aside and get it into tools that will let you then begin to work on, uh, on the web presentation. So this drove an effort to develop a new implementation of the models, one where there wouldn't be multiple copies that have to be maintained and where online support would not be an afterthought. 
Uh, so in September of 2018, a, a hackathon started the effort to re-implement the model in, in Python. And I say re-implement because that's what it is. It's not a new model. It is not a uh, blank sheet of paper development of models for climate solutions. It is a new implementation of an existing methodology. That methodology that the, the Project Radon has developed has already released results on a number of occasions. It's been used in publications. It's undergone a great deal of, uh, of peer review. And so there's a lot of value in that. The new implementation is intended to faithfully reproduce the results of the original and then allow the effort to continue in, in new ways where, uh, where the project has outgrown Excel as a tool. So let's talk about the model. At their core, the drawdown solution models are economic. Uh, the total demand for the particular solution is estimated, uh, where uh, this might be terawatt hours for energy use, it might be uh, passenger kilometers traveled for transportation, it might be the total amount of land area that's uh, suitable for a given practice for agricultural solutions. Once the total possible uh, um, applicability of the solution is determined, then the adoption, the actual realized adoption of the solution towards that total is estimated over time. And from that, the climate impacts, the costs and co-benefits are calculated. Uh, the Excel implementation of the model is honestly pretty well structured. There are tabs in the spreadsheet to encapsulate different modules in the overall model. Uh, so for example, operating cost is a tab. Uh, first cost, which is, which is capital cost, is a tab. Estimation of adoption is a tab. And so the Python implementation follows the same structure. Each module that is a tab in the spreadsheet, like here highlighted as operating cost in the spreadsheet, there is a Python class named operating cost. And data flows between the modules in the same way that it flows through the original uh, model implementation. The previous slide was uh, about the reduction and replacement solutions uh, for things like energy or transportation or the built environment. The land solutions differ uh, in their determination of the, the total applicability of the solution. Um, they use a notion of agroecological zones and thermal moisture regimes. And I'll cover both of those because it becomes a little more important later. Um, for example, forested land land covered by trees of various types, uh, has seven agroecological zones defined. And these cover different combinations of soil health and slope and other factors that determined how that land could be used. Um, grassland has another seven uh, AEZs, cropland, a few other different uh, general categories of land use have AEZs defined. Thermal moisture regimes are defined for things like, is it tropical or temperate? Is the land very humid? Is it semi-arid? Is it, is it very arid? And so solutions that are applicable to tropical forest use the amount of land area that is in both tropical humid thermal moisture regime and a forested agroecological zone to determine the total amount of land area that could be applicable. So when we started working on a Python implementation in late 2018, the first step was to implement a single module, a single tab from the spreadsheet in Python. We added visual basic code to a modified Excel spreadsheet, which would perform most of the calculations in Excel and then use HTTP to post data from what the Excel model had calculated to that point, and then fetch back results from the Python implementation of that one module, the uh, um, running in a Flask web server. The visual basic code then would take the data that it got back, it would paste it into the appropriate cells in the spreadsheet, and it would continue on to compute the rest of the model using Excel. Because Faithfully reproducing the original model uh, is, is key. Uh, we wrote an automated test. It starts Excel using the original unmodified model. It starts Excel again using the modified version using HTTP posts. And it compares each step of the model computation is within a floating point margin of error 
uh, from the new implementation and the old. And that included having to do things like Excel has a very peculiar notion of what rounding a floating point number means. And Python had to duplicate that. Uh, we moved more modules from the spreadsheet into Python until it got to the point where all the spreadsheet was really doing was one big HTTP post, getting the results back and pasting it everywhere. At that point, we discontinued the use of HTTP. The integration test still runs, uh, but it runs the original Excel model. Then it directly runs the Python code. And it does that same comparison step by step. Each step of the model matches the original. The first three drawdown solutions, things like solar farms or silvo, silvo pasture, were constructed manually. Um, two of them were reduction and replacement solutions, one land. Uh, but instead of continuing on then to develop number four and then number five, uh, we wrote a code generator. The code generator can open an Excel file. It can extract the source data and all of the input variables from that solution. And it will then generate a Python class to implement that solution. Um, the integration test is key there, uh, that the generated solution matches the original. And to be perfectly honest, it almost never does on the first try. You, but it does provide a guide of what needs to be debugged. Uh, and so, the, uh, um, so it was much quicker doing it that way than doing each one manually. The code generator handled 70 of the drawdown solutions and, and we replaced the three that had uh, been originally done manually with, uh, with code generated versions of them once it was ready. The remaining solutions are those that differ substantially enough that code generation doesn't work and probably isn't the right way to do it. If, if there's only one solution that, that works in this particular way, there's not a lot of value in developing a code generator versus doing it manually. That's things like plant rich diet. It's the health and education solutions. These will need uh, manual effort. We did this for the Excel models as they were in January of 2019. Uh, however, there was also a cohort of researchers working through the uh, year 2019, and they were updating the Excel models. Python did not work uh, to the point where that could be used for last year's cohort. So we're now going back to pull those updates into Python. 19 of the 70 have been updated, all using code generation. Now, Drawdown also has a notion of a coming attraction. Uh, these are areas that have potential, but where there's really just not data to be able to produce a model to the same degree as, as the rest. Um, that's things like uh, adjusting animal feed to reduce methane emissions or direct air capture of carbon dioxide. The main sticking point is what would be the adoption each year where the only data is basically marketing numbers that people make up. And so as a coming attraction, they can be highlighted, they can be described, but they are not modeled to the same extent. And those will probably remain in Excel. Excel is a good tool uh, for that kind of job. Most of the effort to this point has gone into the backend models. Uh, numbers go in, numbers come out. Um, the user interface we're looking at here is intended for researchers who are looking to work with one of the solutions at a time, uh, maybe to add data, uh, or, and see the impact on the result. Uh, this is a Jupyter notebook. It runs online in a system called Jupyter Hub. Um, this is not the interface we would use to reach a broad audience or for specialized audiences like policymakers or uh, investors. As each Jupyter Hub user gets a home directory, they get a copy of the Git repository. This is a fairly heavyweight way to run the web service. The advantage of doing it this way is we, that we hope to support some capability to contribute data to the solution entirely within the UI. Because each user has a local copy of the Git repository, we can do things like create a Git commit and push it up to GitHub for review. Uh, we think that there's a sizable set of climate researchers who, who might contribute uh, to solutions in their areas of specialization, but they will only do that if it's a pretty lightweight process. If it requires them to take too many steps, probably not. So for that broader audience, for that um, the set of people who are interested in learning about climate solutions, we'll need a different approach. Um, the, we need a, a UI that 
focuses on groups of the drawdown solutions, not an individual solution. So like uh, being able to compare agriculture and, and energy impacts, uh, being able to see what assumptions affect the different sectors. It also has to be a lot lighter in the resources that are used for each user. We can't have a couple hundred megs of, of disk space for each daily active user. Uh, this is much less far along. Uh, what, um, what's shown here is really just a mock-up. It repurposed some of the visualizations and, and data uh, views from the researcher UI that we looked at a moment ago, and it's entirely static. It is not, um, you can't interact with it and, and get any kind of result out of it. It's mostly intended to, so that there will be something. The moment that there's something, it's usually easier to take the next step. Um, the expectation for the, the real system is that the solution models, the Python models, would generate ensembles of results offline. We would save them in a, a file format called netcdf, and that this UI would be interpolating between the different data points that are available in the netcdf. In particular, that it would not be trying to keep hundreds of Python objects running at all times, because inevitably, 99 of them would return a result really quickly and the last one would take forever and we don't know why and eventually we just close the bug because it works on my machine. So what are people's problem? You know how it goes. Um, being able to generate the data in advance and have the UI be uh, snappy is important. I thought I'd talk for a moment about some side quests uh, that a lot of the work, oh, basically all the work described thus far has been a, a, an entirely new implementation of the models, but that's actually not a great way to get something new like that adopted. It's a big jump for the people that are used to working in Excel. And so there's a couple efforts where work done on Python provided something that was useful in the original Excel models and provided one of these smaller steps to take um, toward getting the rest of the Python solution. Um, in the models that were used for the publication of the book several years ago, the land use solutions used percentages at the country level as their basis. So for example, if a given country was 50% forested and 50% of its land was steeply sloped, as a first approximation, um, the model would use 25% steeply sloped forest. Um, it was somewhat more sophisticated than that, but it, it was not a lot more sophisticated than that. And so the, the, um, that's not entirely correct. Now, there's a truism in modeling that all models are wrong, but some are useful. You can get useful results, even when the model isn't entirely correct. Uh, but this is one area where uh, we, we can try to make the model more correct. So the 2020 version of the results that was published in the Drawdown Review last month, the land areas were uh, computed using satellite imagery. Uh, we it took a couple months to implement in 2019. We used data sources for um, land cover and soil health and temperature and moisture and computed new areas for the agroecological zones and thermal moisture regimes. Uh, there's a Python module called GDAL, which was very helpful for that. Another thing, um, if, you've, if you've read through the book, you might have noticed that all of the climate results are communicated in terms of emissions. They're all about gigatons of CO2. There are no temperature results. And the reason for that is straightforward. Uh, it turns out that there are no integrated climate assessment models that are implemented in Visual Basic. Uh, so another bit of recent work went into implementing tools to take emissions results from Excel and get them into a, uh, a system that can run a finite amplitude impulse response. The, the tool, particular tool used is implemented uh, in Python uh, and it takes emissions data and calculates impact on temperature and atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. Um, this talk focused on the solution models, which is the area that, that I work on most directly. Uh, there is a larger effort to build an online knowledge system of which the solution models will be a part. Uh, there's a video linked here from the Research to Action Conference, uh, the conference I mentioned back at the start of the talk uh, at Penn State University. And it discussed that knowledge system and some of the larger plans. There isn't as much detail, um, not as much development has yet gone into those portions. 
Uh, there's also a couple other links here of plans and documents and, and videos of, of what exists in the, the parts of the system. Um, if people are interested in helping, there are three GitHub repositories. The first one, the solutions repository, is where the backend models have been developed, where the researcher UI, that Jupyter notebook, has been developed. Um, and that's where most of the activity has happened. The spatial AEZ repository is where the work on satellite imagery was done. I think at this point that's, that's basically done. There's, not a, um, there's nothing pending or more to do there yet. Um, the Explorer repository is the new one and it contains that tiny little bit of code for the mocked up UI about uh, for broader audiences. So if you are interested in helping, the issue tracker in the solutions repository has a number of issues open and a good portion of them are labeled as good first issue, meaning you don't need to come up to speed on a great deal of what exists to be able to contribute. Um, to be honest, where the most help is needed though is in UI treatments, particularly for broader audiences because I, I really have no idea what I'm doing. Um, so people who are interested in uh, maybe doing further work with the mock-up to explore what we might do, what we might be able to offer or, or visualize, or people interested in working with the real backend, working with net CDF files uh, and, and fetching data, that would all be quite welcome. If you'd like to get in touch, uh, email and Twitter and the Climate Action Tech uh, Slack are all good. Um, I, my preference would be to use the decarbon.earth address that I list here uh, because I expect to have it for some time. For correspondence, it's very specifically about Project Drawdown. I do have a drawdown.org email address. I will likely just forward the email. I cannot speak for the project. I am a volunteer, uh, but I can pass things on. Um, if you check LinkedIn, you will note that I am employed in the tech industry, but it is completely unrelated to this, uh, to the work that has been described here today. And in fact, negotiations at hiring uh, codified that into the contract. So don't read much into the LinkedIn page uh, with respect to climate. And that's it. Are there questions? Yes. Oh. Folks, um, are you able to share this back to me now? Um, let's see. If, have you, have you, uh, I just need to check. Are we back into the gallery view, folks? I cannot tell, Jensen, you are, yeah? I have stopped sharing my screen. Okay, awesome, all right. So there's a few things we can do here for questions, actually. Uh, the thing I was gonna ask some of you folks to do, if you'd be so kind, uh, we've actually got a little tool specifically for managing questions uh, to get a few of them together, right? Uh, and I'd like to just basically provide a bit of time for everyone to take a minute to like have a bit of a think and then uh, share uh, some questions into this tool, which I've just shared a link to in the Slack, uh, in, 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 the chat, in, in the chat here. It's called Slido. And uh, I think if I share my screen very, very briefly, you'll see how some of it works. And uh, the, it's designed to make it easy for us to see a bunch of questions coming in from, from this. So I think you should see a set, uh, something listed here with two questions. Is that correct? I'm not sure if you can. I do see the, I see your shared screen, yes. Excellent, all right. So basically the thing, uh, if, you, if you have a question, please just take a moment to add, as a type of question into here when you as at the link below. And then what we'll do is once we've had a chance from the questions, we'll basically have a vote on which are the most, uh, seem to be most pertinent for the entire group, largely to, uh, and then uh, the top voted questions, we'll spend a bit of time discussing for each of those. So uh, amazingly, Zoom does not provide a way to have like a timer on the screen. So what I'm gonna ask yeah. you to do is uh, basically bear with me while I uh, Google timer one minute, and then have a bit of a think add a question into the search that I've added. And then, uh, and please do, uh, and then after that minute, we'll take a mo moment to read through and then vote on those. And then we'll discuss the, the highest ranking questions inside the room. Does that sound okay, folks? Okay, cool. All right, so here's what we do. Uh, timer, one minute. Please do add your questions and then we'll see what comes in from there. Start.
I apologize for the noise this makes. It's really awful. I'm so sorry, everyone, but okay. All right, do we have any questions? Let's see if this comes through. Oh, we do, great. Okay, now, um, great, we've got a nice um, a set of these actually so far. Um, if you folks are okay, I'd suggest if we can, take say 30 seconds to just have a quick read of the questions that we have there. And then uh, we'll start with the one from the very top and then Denton, I'll, uh, my thinking is if I read the question out, or if, I, if we find out who actually asked that, give them a chance to ask that question and then we'll have a bit of time for you to actually respond to that. Does that sound okay, Denton? Sure. Okay, cool. All right. So 30 seconds for voting on this. Oh, bollocks, I've got it all wrong. Sorry, everyone. The goal of this is largely to allow people who may be somewhat quieter to put forward a question so we don't immediately go to the first person to raise their hand. And I, as a, I know that I'm basically speaking a load here, but we're trying to avoid, uh, we're trying to do this to counteract the, the likelihood of people speaking all the time, basically. And I think this is, oops, I'm just gonna close this now, see what we have. Okay, all right. So we've got one question. Uh, okay, this, this was actually a cheat. Um, I kind of was a, this, this one was actually from me, folks. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now because I don't think it actually adds too much to it. Um, I initially was going to, I kind of seeded this uh, in case no one had a question about uh, whether these questions did actually relate to whether the, draw, the solutions had an impact on each other. And I... I can just answer it. It's, a, it's an interesting yeah. question. Yeah, please do. Um, yeah. That is uh, handled in an integration step. Yes, some of the, the solutions do interact. Uh, each solution is first calculated individually, the integration step, which is currently a manual process, and that bugs me, um, handles those interactions. So for example, all of the energy solutions put together cannot add up to more than the world demand for energy. Uh, another type of example is some of the solutions provide feedstock that goes into others. Biochar uses leftover agricultural waste. And so things like the perennial bioenergy solution uh, one of their outputs is how much waste will be left at the end, and that feeds into biochar. So those sorts of interactions are handled in an integration step, which then feeds back to the original solutions and calculates new results based on integrated inputs. Cool. Thank you very much for that. All right. Um, we also have another question. Uh, I'll just read it out here, um, which was uh, got seven votes, same as this. You mentioned the fact there is a cost analysis at the heart of the model. Do you have a standard carbon cost you use? Now, first of all, if the person is, uh, would like to put their hand, uh, if they want to actually expand on that question, they're more than welcome to. And if you can, please do raise your hand or send a message to me. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so you have got someone. Uh, Benedetto, um, yeah, the floor is used. Feel free to expand and then we can get hopefully a nice uh, answer from that. Yeah, okay, great. Can you hear me? Okay, great, awesome. Um, yeah, so I wanted to understand a little bit more about the, um, the, cost, the cost benefit analysis that you mentioned at the beginning with the model. So uh, I guess that different uh, carbon costs uh, result in two different optimal solutions. So is that a data that you use and how do you uh, factor that into the model? Okay. Um, the costs that are calculated by the models as, as they are now are the costs of implementing the solution and in, in two ways, capital cost that is referred to as first cost and operating cost per year. So for example, the wind power solutions have a substantial capital cost. You have to build the windmills and then an operating cost uh, per terawatt hour per year. The drawdown model does not assume that there will be a price on carbon. I, 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 mean, I think everyone fully agrees that that's a valid policy step that could be taken, but the drawdown models do not make that assumption and do not factor it in. Um, a lot of those types of things where a policy or a decision that we as a, a society make will feed back and affect the demand for a given solution, the, the drawdown model is not that sophisticated. It does not have those kinds of feedback loops uh, in its current form. 
Cool, thank you for that, Denton. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, all right, next question that came from this was another anonymous question. Are you aware of any corporations or public bodies that use the drawdown model directly and how do they use them? Thinking in terms of UI slash UX needs. Is there someone who wanted to expand on this or who put, put their thought? If, if you put, your, put this question forward, you've got a chance to expand on it. But if not, then uh, you can also just, as we can just uh, put it to you as well, Denton. Is there anyone who was on it? I'm looking on cameras and I don't see no one's faces. So I'm guessing that it's an anonymous question. So Denton, I imagine you'll okay. be answering this to, yeah, what, what, anonymously. Okay. Um, I don't know of corporations using the model. And that if it does uh, happen, I, I don't know of it. The Drawdown does work with other similar research organizations. One that I'm most familiar with is the Exponential Roadmap. Uh, that's a, a um, initiative in the, uh, they uh, unveiled their results, their plan and their, uh, their website uh, at the Climate Action Summit last year. Uh, some of the data that they used came from Project Drawdown, uh, the bulk of the, and they also did the bulk of their work as, as original work. So the project does cooperate with other similar efforts. Cool. Thank you, Anton. Okay, the next question down here was one from Jamie Bevo, the, uh, and uh, Jamie, I might leave, let you kind of draw this, explain this one out, actually. Uh, actually I'll, I'll follow the format and then I'll hand over to you if that's okay, Jamie. Yeah, okay. So the question is, what spatial disaggregation is there in the drawdown models? Uh, is this global? And if so, are there plans to draw down to, to drill down to a country level? Um, Jamie, I'll let you expand on that in a bit more detail, actually. But what yes, is your so hands, so people can see you. Hello. Uh, yes, this was partly stimulated by a conversation on CAT um, just yesterday, the day before, I think. Um, but, uh, but also just thinking about um, houses, for example, there's quite a huge variation in, in dwelling types and sizes and heat and fuels and things in different regions and different countries of the world. And, and I was just wondering to what extent you model different regions or individual countries, or, or indeed if you just look at the global picture and, and whether there are any plans to, to look in, uh, find a granularity. Sure. Um, the model as, there, as it is now uh, has uh, a few major regions. So for example, all of the OACD 90 countries together are, are computed as a region. Uh, Latin America is a region, uh, Asia, Middle East and Africa. And so the, the model will produce results for each of those major regions, plus a few countries or, or, or uh, blocks of countries of, uh, that are, um, how to phrase this, whose emissions are such that modeling them separately is useful. Um, that is uh, the EU, China, India, and the United States. Um, those four countries are part of one of the major regions and they are also broken out separately. In the book, in most of the results, um, all of the published results are about the world because it, for a number of the solutions, it's really hard to get solid data on each of those regions around the world. Um, energy is one where you generally can. The IEA and the INA have, have really good data around the whole world, but um, agricultural practices, it, it, the, the data availability is somewhat more uneven. And so the published results have focused on the world. Now, there's definitely, a, you asked about individual countries, there's definitely a desire to do that. Um, the, to be able to act on the information one gets out of the models, it's uh, it, the ability to act goes up as the model is more relevant. So there's, there's a desire, but not currently in the model. Cool. All right. Um, okay, next, next question from here was one from, I believe it's Tom Brown, who's also in Germany. Um, this is a quick one. Quick clarification. How is the percentage adoption rate for each solution determined? Is it by the user? Is there a cost optimization? Or and if there is optimization, which solver? This is a really, really, really technical question. But then again, Tom is a PhD in this stuff and uh, this is his day job. So uh, um, I'll, Tom, I'll let you expand in a bit more detail, but you may need to um, make this a bit easier for people who aren't uh, necessarily PhDs in modeling as well. Okay, so yeah, fire, fire away, Tom. Yeah, I just wanted to understand what the computational bo bottlenecks were for you. Like, are you formulating this 
with an objective function and constraints and then passing it to an optimization solver? Yeah. Uh, that's the question. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, nothing quite that, nothing that sophisticated, no. Um, the adoption estimations, it does vary by, um, particularly by sector. Um, so for the energy sector, there's very good data available of uh, energy consumption to this point from IEA, from IANA. They also have predictions. One can, uh, one can question the predictions that they have made in the past, uh, but uh, nonetheless, there's at least something to go on. Um, other solutions have perhaps less solid data available. Um, and so where there's not peer reviewed studies available, the, the project will use what data there is. And sometimes that, that turns into a sigmoid function. There's a, a market um, adoption function called the, I'm, I may mispronounce this, the BAS diffusion model. That, that, that is a person's name and I don't know if it's BAS or BASE. But um, the, where there is data to uh, inform the parameters of that kind of adoption model, that will be used. Uh, there's never a solver, though. Uh, that would be interesting uh, as a, something to, to uh, work toward in the future, but not currently. Okay, folks, um, we've got a tiebreaker of um, the next question. They all have the same amount of votes. Um, if you'd be so kind as to quick, take a quick look and uh, have, give another round of voting so it's easier for us to actually spend the last, say, five, ten minutes answering the most pertinent questions, please do take a time. Please do have a quick look at that. And then hopefully we can then uh, finish this up. Uh, Denton, I hope this isn't too exhausting for you because I do realize it feels like maybe you're being grilled. By all these oh, groups. this is all good. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right then. Okay, so we've had a few, we've had a few more changes now. All right. Um, I now have a bit of a steer on what the next most in, uh, kind of interested popular question is. Uh, on our chat in cat, you talked about why fly less wasn't explicitly and open. Could you please summarize your understanding of fly less? Uh, I, this is from uh, Julian. Um, Julian, if you're in the room, would you like to like maybe expand on it a bit more to give Denton a bit more time to like think of an answer? Yeah, sure. Well, thanks, Dan, for taking all the time to do this. It's absolutely brilliant. It's always a pleasure to work with you because you know you do amazing work. It's incredible to see the engineering behind that too. So, thanks very much for that. Um, and uh, yeah, so. I, so the recap was that of all the solutions, the, the background is that I'm working actually with another CAT member to create a consumer version of a product that will help people take directly actionable outcomes. So what can an end user do to actually, so what's the drawdown consumer view? What's the direct impact? Uh, and then when I was getting some feedback from that, Jamie who's also on the call brought up and said, well, well you know, why isn't flights brought up, fly less? Um, and in fact, Flyless has been brought up in the CNN quiz that was published on Drawdown, and that aggregated a few different things. But ultimately, um, what I understand of it is that, you know, probably most people in this group, when they go through a carbon calculation, it's flights. That is just by far the biggest component. Um, and there was a little bit of history about how that's not necessarily representative, but it'd be, I'd really love to get a view on where what you think the stances of Project Drawdown with respect to actionable, consumer actionable elements and the, the role of fly less, because even if you aggregate those three, it's actually a really small amount. And so is it really true or is there a scoping where they say that kind of thing is different to, to what we're talking about? So that's kind of what we're trying to figure out. That, sorry, I rambled a bit, but does that okay. help? Sure. Um, let me give kind of two different answers. Um, when like, for example, when Jonathan Foley talk, gives talks about the drawdown results, um, he does mention flight and the alternatives to flying. Uh, the net contribution in, in emissions of uh, air travel is, let, let's face it, it is smaller than the emissions from the energy sector. It is smaller than the emissions from ground transportation. Uh, it is a sector where uh, individual choices bear, um, have a, a role to play, where in the overall energy sector, uh, any individual doesn't get to choose whether we build more coal or natural gas or, or, or uh, renewables. So when talking, uh, those solutions do get brought together and we talk about, and, and uh, Dr. Foley talks about flying less as a solution. 
the actual models though um, do not work in terms of um, aspirational things. How would we achieve a given outcome and then model that? The models work by taking uh, ideally peer reviewed source data and calculating results from it. So the models way of representing flyless is what's the possible adoption for the alternatives to flying? And then uh, have that be impact the number of air kilometers traveled. All right, um, we have one more question from, Magen uh, from someone called Roloff. I do hope I've pronounced it okay. Uh, Roloff, are you in the room still? Uh, if he isn't. I'm here. Hi, everyone. Okay, brilliant. Uh, Roloff, um, I'm handing, handing over to you to like, expand on your question a little bit more. I'm just going to read it out for the recording. So sure. the, the question was, what's the plan for how this version of an online drawdown UI relates to ongoing policy discussions? And how do you imagine it being used most effectively? So, yeah, not, not much to add to that. Yeah, mainly just how, how do you imagine? Since, of course, the, the publication, the book was Quite, quite something. It really had a, had a kind of a large effect, at least uh, how I look at it. So I'm curious to know more, how do you contextualize, like what would you want to get out of a, an extension of that by kind of more interactive simulation where, where people can get, you know, try out different things. Um, but like you say, there's like technical challenges. You don't want to have everyone have a hundred megabyte you know, footprint and disk space, but you do want to, you know, have people have a play with it and understand these things more. Um, this, at this point, I'll emphasize, this is my um, opinion of what some of the things that need to happen to reach an audience of specifically policymakers. It is uh, an area that within Project Drawdown they're actively discussing and so other, um, you know, the other plans may come of it. But at least for me, the models as they are now, the costs, that first cost of capital cost, the operating cost, those are outputs. That is, if we figure out what's the possible adoption of the given solution over time, calculate how much that will cost. And when you're making policy decisions, you rarely have the ability to just spend whatever is required. So um, one of the things that I think would be useful for reaching policymakers is use cost as an input. Use cost as an input to a solver. I have 20 million euros to spend in my budget. What is the most effective way for the level of government I am at or the uh, uh, business I am in or whatever it is to spend 20 million euros, what is the biggest impact? Uh, the models do not do that now, but I, that's something that I think would be very useful in reaching that kind of audience. Okay, cool, thank you, Dent. All right, we're coming up to the last few minutes now. Uh, there's probably space for one more question. And uh, then if it's okay, we'll probably start wrapping up. Uh, so I can share it so we can basically get this shared for other people and uh, you can have like this to, to think about for the rest of the day. So the final question for us from a gentleman called Ryan, uh, could be a woman actually. I mean, uh, Michael Burnham is a, is a woman in Star Trek. Uh, so you mentioned that Excel was a good approachable first choice. Uh, Jupiter and Python less so, uh, uh, sorry, obviously less so. Um, how has reception been from drawdown researchers? Ryan, is there any more you'd like to add to that question if you're still in the room? Cool. That's okay. it. All right. Um, so reception has been uneven. Uh, the cohort of researchers last year made almost no use of the Python models. Uh, they were not in a state that um, you could really do useful work in them. The uh, senior researchers who've been with the project longer, some of them have really taken to it and, and are giving feedback and some of them have not. Um, if I have one kind of regret of uh, how the project has gone to this point. That first step I mentioned where we had an Excel file that was using HTTP to post to Python and do part of the model. The original intention of that was that that's how the research team would start using it. That they would get to keep their Excel file exactly as it was and exactly as they were comfortable using it and then we would incrementally replace portions of it. Um, that didn't work out. The, the, that even that was too big of a step uh, and, and uh, too much change. And so we, uh, we did not go with that approach, but I, I kind of do wish that we had. Yep, and with that. Cool, thank you for that, Denton. Um, uh, folks, Denton got up very, very early because he's on 
I, I'm speaking from Berlin, but Denton is speaking from uh, Pacific, uh, the west coast of America. So this is 9 a.m. for him, actually. So we're just going to wrap up now. If I may, I'm just going to briefly share my screen to explain what happens next. Let's see, come up from here. I'm not sure if you can see my screen. Can you folks see a screen? Okay, good. All right. So we spoke about developing drawdown. We had time for Q&A. We've actually tried using Slido to make it a bit easier for people to see what's going on. The last thing is entirely optional and it's just a bit of fun and it does make it easier for us to talk about this and do something to build more of a community around this kind of thing. I'd like it if you are, if you're up for doing this to please switch your camera on and then wave to the camera when I stop sharing my screen so we can get something like a kind of cat pic, like a selfie just for us, just so we have something as a kind of memorial thing to kind of refer to this. So when, it, when we, to create some social proof for other people to do this for future talks that we're doing. Um, if you're okay with doing that, now, now's your time to do that or switch on your favorite kind of Zoom background or something like that. If you don't want to do this, that's totally okay. Just uh, switch off your video and that'd be fine. But uh, yeah, that's kind of largely it. I'm gonna switch stuff, share my screen now. So because, oh wow, loads of faces. All right, so now just like, I'm just gonna ask you to kind of wave. Yeah, that's it, perfect. All right, cheers guys and ladies and everyone in between. Thank you very much for that. Okay, this has been uh, the first cat video that we've done and uh, it feels like it's been pretty awesome. I've learned, I've learned a load about uh, Drawdown and seen some absolutely awe-inspiring uh, Zoom backgrounds. Uh, if nothing else. Um, you can continue the conversation in Slack. And uh, the what I'll do is as soon as we can get this uh, transcoded or whatever Zoom does on its servers, we'll make that uh, available for folks to discuss. And one thing we may be able to do is have some other kind of Q&A from that. But thank you very much for this kind of leap of faith. And uh, have a not lovely time, but I guess, you know, wish you back to the isolation and terror. Um, enjoy the, to the extent that you can the rest of the week and uh, yeah, there'll be more of these coming along. So thank you everyone and uh, have a lovely time. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks everyone for organizing. Thanks to Anton for your time. Thank you. Bye. ta -ra. Cool. That seemed to more or less work. Denton, that was, I really enjoyed that, mate. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. It went pretty well. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to switch off the recording now. And